uh, portion groups and uh, homework. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so homework is directly related to the midterm material. I just don't want to pressure you to you know finalize it. Is it going to include normal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for that. Like at first it said equal, and the gap part is like. I mean isomorphic. Everything is isomorphic. Yeah. Yeah. Like isomorphic. Oh okay. Yep. So in today's lecture, we actually yes. <laughs> because you did recitation when I was not here on Monday. Yeah, but you teach a lot of new stuff. It's not the two. I think every recitation he teaches a lot of new stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, when I was doing recitation, I was also teaching new stuff. It's like the way everybody has different recitations up to them. Uh, Okay, so today we actually are gonna do something very interesting. Um, I mean, I think I started with like every time. <laughs> so we're gonna do something really interesting. So we are approaching pseudo theorems, and I told you that we are approaching this, and this is like a big part of this course and stuff. But today we're gonna prove pseudo theorems for abelian groups, and as you can expect, this is gonna be simpler than proving pseudo theorems for general groups. In, so last semester when I taught this class, I skipped this. And the reason I skipped this is like, why do you need to separately prove it for abelian only in a couple of months to reprove it for general groups? And so I skipped this lecture altogether. But now I changed my mind, and the reason is that this is Friday, so not everybody's here, so even if you kind of like miss this, it's not going to be super bad. Uh, but at the same time, the proof of pseudo theorem is very hard uh, for general thing, for general groups. So this, but the proof of this thing for general groups is going to be a complication in some sense on the proof for abelian groups. So we might as well go with the proof of abelian groups, kind of like learn from it, understand every single detail, and then when we're actually gonna go into proof of pseudo theorem, this will be easier, right? Because at, like at this point, you should kind of see that some of these groups are the same, just like repeating in a new language and like all of this stuff. So today is gonna be our like first introduction to this style of proof in a sense. So yeah, okay. So let's start. Uh, so we are creating pseudo theorems for Billing, and I'm gonna start with this lemma which is a technical lemma, and I hope somebody can solve it. Uh, so, so for today, group is always finite. Okay, G is a group, is always gonna be a finite for today. And then I claim the following, uh, for G in G, if G to the X is T, and G to the Y is T, and X and Y are relatively prime, then G is E. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, who can throw this? Mm -hmm. This could be a. Uh, your That's an issue correct now. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Obviously. Uh, G to the X to the Y. And yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah. So, like, even if you don't know immediately how to prove it, like, just write everything down, right? So, like, we have this, and from that, immediately you should write there is this a b such that a of x plus b y is equal to one, right? And then you just take g to the one is g to the a x plus dy is equal to g to the x to the a g to the to the y b and this becomes e a e b becomes yeah okay so very very simple lemma and you're gonna see like a lot of varieties of this lemma uh, but like the, the proof and the concept is Right? Okay. So let us now start the first theorem. 
and this is our first existence result. Uh, theorem. Uh, I wrote Cauchy for a DLN, but I will just say some kind of silo result. This is what the textbook says. Uh, suppose G is finite. Suppose G is finite. Because order of A is the subgroup generated by A. Because order of A is the order of a subgroup generated by A, and it's going to be exactly B. So from here, you need to look at here. But if you look at this statement, you know that the subgroup of order B should be cyclic. And then you can find the generator of this cyclic subgroup, and it's going to be B. Okay. Again, good preparation for the mission to check all of this. So, yeah, so we're going to prove this result. Uh, yeah, and uh, for any any G finite a billion any prime which divides order, we can find such element. So the, to prove this, we're going to use induction, and uh, the claim is going to be the following. So in induction, fix P uh, claim. Uh, claim. Okay, let's. How should I put this? Uh, a and statement. Uh, theorem is true for uh, groups. Of order uh, okay so this is the proper way to set this up so uh, kind of like our our theorem starts with G and then you assume some kind of P device that but the proof is going to be different wait group of order and P Yes, you can, yeah, sure. You can say M, P, but you can also say M, and for some M, P is not going to divide it, and this claim is going to be true because P does not divide it. <coughs> oh. Okay. I mean, your theorem is going to be true because this part does not exist. So, obviously, the claim holds if the assumptions of this claim just do not hold. Right? Yeah. Like, in the set of Camels, every elephant is red. I don't Unless there is a camel elephant, yeah. I understand the alternative part, but I don't know why there is this A plus B such that there is a second. No, we didn't prove it. Huh? We didn't prove it yet. I mean, do you understand how to go from this claim to here? I don't. So H is going to have. Yeah, H is a sample, but why H is a so you should you should prove to yourself that every group of prime order is cyclic. Why? Oh yeah, no, I remember that. Uh oh. It'll span across the entire. Uh, How, what's the formula for that? Either e or p, and this p. Uh, e is not a. Oh yeah, it's a it's a it's it's so this, yeah. And then you show that you get a contradiction. I mean, the formal proof is that I just need to pick an element which is not identical. 
yeah, yeah. look at its order. Yeah. Its order should divide. I mean, its order is not going to be one because it's not the identity. It's and the one that's a visor is B. Yeah. And we know that it should divide by Lagrange's theorem. Right? Yeah, so yeah, it yeah. has to be ordered. Yeah, yeah. Right? So that's the truth. Okay. So, so yeah, like, and here it's very important. Like, I fix, it's kind of like the structure of this proof is that I, I'm going to fix P and then only work with this P. <laughs> For now, but then if I prove this for given p, I kind of can now reverse my things. I can start with g and then apply p. Like small details. Okay, uh, and this is my induction statement that that theorem calls for all groups of fixed order. Okay, and by the way, we didn't prove this, and this is kind of more a philosophical question rather than that. Uh, proof that there are only finite and many groups of given order. By the way, why? Why there are only finite and many groups of given order? Didn't we say this last class with? Uh... <coughs> no, we didn't say this last class. Or maybe we did. Given that G is finite, or just all fixed order. It's because we said the homeomorphic image of G is the same as. No, no, no. It's, no, I'm asking a completely different thing. I'm asking why there are only finite and many groups you can come up with. Of given order. It's just like, oh. like the permutation is finite of length. No. Number of I mean, yeah, I'm saying it's a big number because of combinatorial. You know, I mean, basically, because what is group? It's actually just a table where you list all of the elements here, list all of the elements here, and then you plug all of this from this set. Mm. And some of them are going to be groups because they satisfy X, and some of them are not going to be groups. But essentially, like the here you have at most, like if if your set is n, you multiply this number. There are like at most n choices here, at most n choices here, at most n choices here. So there are at most what? m to the power n <coughs> squared groups of order n. But like there are much, much less. Okay? Do you understand what I mean by this thing? You're saying like I don't understand. Why are you multiplying? That's like a key to the Yeah, yeah so, 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 so imagine like this is your set. Like your set has four elements. And now I want to give it a group structure. Oh, okay. I just need to give a group structure. I just need to kind of like put something when I multiply the elements. So then, shouldn't it only be n squared? Right? No, but in, in each in each thing, I can put n different options. So I can put n different options when what is a times a. I can put n different options what a times b. Oh, okay. So yeah. And so for each of them is n squared. Oh, like how many how many things are there? There are n times. Yeah. N. So it is n to the n squared, okay? But like a lot of them, they're not going to be groups, right? Like you can also see when the group is abelian. It's essentially when you have this matrix that you can invert it, right? And like you can see the properties of the groups in here. Like not every table group can be a group, but this is why they're like kind of many groups. Okay, so let's go back to, into this plane. This is our induction assumption. Uh, let us prove the base. And the base is for this. Well, you're gonna have like claim A1. Uh, it, the claim is true for order of G equals one. Well, there's only one group in the claim, so obviously true for that because there's no prime which divides it. I don't know, actually, is one prime? No. no. So I got this on this book, I think it's prime. Oh, really? Well, we always say what is not prime. By the way, have you received? Uh, so there's like a guy, he's a PhD student at NYU, and he made this huge list of questions. Like there's a hundred questions on it, and basically it's a survey of all mathematicians. For example, do natural numbers include zero or not? And that oh, is cool. Have you seen it? No. I'm gonna send you a link. And basically, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he gave an extensive. He, he also analyzes this data, which is very interesting because he gives like. Physicists, they say this, mathematicians tend to say this, if a person had like PhD education, they tend to say this. 
And basically, there is like, I, I wanted to, to send it to you, but I will do it later. There is actually a question about this group, which we dealt with, which we also like denoted by this, the multiplication. What's like the proper notation of this? And like, it's like 30 to 60 to 10. Like the results, some people denote it differently. So yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, that, that's just the. To, to address that the notation is very preference based. Okay, so we have a one claim, and now let's prove induction claim. So suppose, suppose f for all k plus than, I think this structure is, yeah, less than, and minus one, a k is true. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember what strong induction I means. What's the point of it? This strong. I mean, because I mean, because 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 sometimes it is hard. Sometimes it is hard to establish this directly. Right. You kind of like want to assume everything previously to some. But when you assume yeah. everything previously, you have to prove more base cases. You have to do more yeah, base cases more to be sure it is correct. I just need to prove the first base case. No. What? The first base case is not enough. You have to, you have. It's, you use strong induction because like there's a. I, 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 you really need to do more base cases. If you I think you need to. This case is enough because you start with. This case is okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you are a philosophy major, not me. So let me just, if you, if you want, let's give a separate proof for the, for. Uh, order of G is P. What's the proof here? Itself. It's the sub. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, sure. So we proved it, and we can also prove it for everything between 1 and P because P does not divide stuff. So we proved all of the claims up until A is Good? Yeah. Okay. So let us now concentrate on the induction. So suppose all of the all of the groups of order less than n minus one satisfy our theorem, and now let's get into the beef, which is why is it true for a? So pick G such that order of G is equal to uh, to n. Okay. If there is no such subgroup, if there is no such group, we are done. But there is always exist one, so this is not, not the case. Uh, if P does not divide order of G, we are done, right? Because then our claim falls automatically. We are. We only need to really care about the case when P divides from the Okay, that's the interesting and important case. Uh, okay, so suppose P divides order of G. Can I erase this? Will you remember this? Yeah. Okay, because I can move to there. Or does he erase the right one? You can erase the left, right? Oh, I thought that the right one is more important, but okay. Oh, yeah, that's oh, the yeah, that's, 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 that's Use the blackboard. Yeah, Sorry? can you use this one? Yeah. Yeah, you can move okay. And it's right back. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so. Which case are we? We are in order of g equals m. We are in this case. P divides order of g. So claim if there exists a subgroup in g such that p divides order of h, we are done. Why? Thank you, thank you. We know that it already goes up to n minus one. Yeah. And then what could h be n? What's the real subgroup? Yeah. 
So, so I mean, I kind of like forgot to say H is not equal to B, right? I want to tell oh, you. Oh, because you did. Yeah, it goes for all of us then. Yeah, so if H is not G, H is just gonna have order strictly in the last known order of G, right? And we also know that B divides order of H, and so this is gonna be in the case A order of H. Right, we kind of like, we have this somewhere over here where we assume the claim is true for all smaller ones. So since we assume the claim is true for all smaller ones, there exists element A in H of order B, but this is also element in G. It's gonna have the same order, right? So here, by induction, there exists element A in H, such that order of A is B, and uh, yet A is also in G and it's going to have the same order. And again, nice exercise as a preparation for your midterm. Prove that if you have element in the subgroup of a sum order, then in the original group it has the same order. That okay. seems so like. Yeah, yeah. But like. That's well, like, yeah, that's the point. Like, we should be able to. Yeah, yeah, but like that's already because you have a lot of intuition and practice, and you kind of like know which statements are true. But probably if I asked you like this on the like, like yeah, you you would like wait why and stuff, right? But like now it's kind of like it's not, like there's no way to tell. Okay, so yeah, so we are done with this part. If there exists a subgroup, uh, second part, if G has no subgroups and I mean non trivial for this thing, then we are done. Why? Then the only subgroup is G. Yeah, but why does there, like, why? Yeah, yeah, but like, how do you finish to, to this? If G has no subgroups. Then the generator has to be G. I mean has the generator has to generate G. Big G. Can you rephrase this? If G has no subgroups, then G is what? That's about cyclic. cyclic. It is cyclic, but it is also cyclic of prime order. Right? And also this is a very good preparation for your meter. That, or, uh, that order of G is prime. Well, that's an if and only if statement. And G is cyclic. So, yeah. One way over there. Yeah, let's put it if and only Yeah. Wait, that's just uh, <laughs> LeBron, but. Yeah, I mean, the, from the here to right. here. Yeah. It no, it's not LeBron. Like, from here. Well, if it has a subgroup, then there's no. Yeah, but like but from here to here, it's not the branch. It's like the. Mm, it's like it's basically like Lagrange. If A, then B. So if not B, then not A. Yeah, but this is still one direction. If A implies B, and you're saying it's the same thing, if not B implies not A, well, it's the same thing implies B. Right? You still. Yeah, that like is the same thing. Yeah. Okay, Lagrange is given. Group, we need we know how it will, what is its order it should be otherwise, but we don't have the same in reverse. Yeah, but like that's what happens here is like for here, yes, because here is everything is nice. If like yeah. prime and B, yeah. 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 yeah, okay, so check this for me term as a preparation. So, okay, we have two cases this case good, this case good. So, the only bad case. Is which we didn't cover is that there exists a subgroup H in G, and I started to use this notation today for some reason, like H is a subgroup of G, right? And uh, so order of H is bigger than one, like I don't want to talk about trivial stuff, is less than order of G, right? Non trivial subgroup. And uh, and I cannot assume that B divides order of H. And B does not divide order of H. Okay, so this is the only case which we need to prove. And this is the most interesting case. 
I have a quick question. Yeah. Why, like so far, have we needed the fact that G is a billion? No. Okay, go ahead. We can move. Are we going to? Speak? Yeah, yeah, you can. Okay, but that's, that's a very good point. Like, technically the proof of pseudo theorem without the billion case will also, all of this will all end up in here. We'll all sign up in here, but like this is the meat, like this is the, the hard part. And uh, and uh, so why do you think we need a billion? <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's good, you know. That means that you kind of like you start to get this mathematical, you know, professional intuition oh, of what we need to do. Also, groups in uh, billion groups are normal. Yes, exactly, exactly. And that's. That's going to be an essential part when we're going to assume that it's not a billion, that we will not automatically be able to conclude that this thing is normal, and we will not be automatically able to, walk, to form a quotient group. And that's why we care about them all. We're going to have to do some different tricks here. But we know that since it's a billion, since G is a billion, H is normal. So in particular, we can form a quotient group. In particular, G over H is quotient. And why do you think I want to form a quotient group? Then I can use my That's That's kind of the basis of why induction arguments are so have such a nice connection to quotient stuff. You know, you have any kind of induction argument, and as soon as you are able to form a quotient, you you can assume that this result holds for quotient. Oh, well, it like reduces like how many things you have to check. Like, because our quotient, all, like when you make a quotient group, you just like dividing. Yeah. Like, a bunch of... Yeah, but like you you don't automatically can come back from quotient. You have this result for quotient, and the the real game is that from the result for quotient obtain the result for original stuff. And this is usually the hardest part. But this, all of this machinery is very standard for, we're gonna see, I'm gonna repeat the same proof maybe at some point, and like this, we will see this a lot of times, like this induction things. And, but this part becomes now starts to be different. How do we go back from quotient group? So since, Order of a quotient group is what? What's the order of the quotient group? For uh, the M and H, H. No. How many right classes are there? So the index of oh, what are the index, index, index of H. H. Index of H. Index of H. Or otherwise, order of G divided by order of H. This is strictly less than, the right than uh, uh, M. Right, we assume that G has order M. This is strictly less than that. Uh, what is what is the index of H? Index of H is how many right processes? Are there? Index of H is it, it's just defined. So that was right after we did the Brahms theorem. Yeah. Okay. Index of H is like mutual. It's just how many how many different right cosets yeah. are yeah. there of H yeah. before yeah. before it gets yeah. repeated again? Yeah, you can think about that. This is just a definition of index. Yeah. Okay, so we get that this is less than that. But also note that we are in this case that P does not divide order of H. Okay? So P does not divide order of H, and yet we assume that P divides order of G. So this means that P, so thus P divides order of G quotient. Right, so it divides the top part, it does not divide the bottom part, based on like our assumptions over there. Okay. So could you elaborate? Yeah, yeah. So so P divides this part. What? Oh uh, yeah. Because we're in like we are in that case on top. Yeah. But like P does not divide this because we're in like the bottom case. And so P has to divide. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so now we can use our reduction assumption. Uh, G quotient H is some subgroup. It is divisible by P 
its order is less than n, so we can apply our induction to conclude that there exists an element of uh, order p. So, by induction, there exists some right pulse set, I'm going to denote it by x, in g over n, such that order of x is p. Okay? But this is not what we want. This is some kind of right cause set, but we kind of want to recover an element in G from this right cause. So now we gotta do like the dirty work. So let uh, there exist some G in G. I don't want to put G. Yeah, and uh, there exists some G in G such that X is equal to um, G. Right, we write some kind of like representation for this right faucet. And then we rewrite this statement. Then, uh, so what does this mean? This means that x to the power p is p. Let's say, I mean m. Let's keep it as m. Our, our identity element in the quotient group is just uh, m. What is h? Oh yeah, you swap because all the time we've been using h. Oh. Sure, sorry. Let's keep it H, H, H. Yeah, okay, everything's H. Okay, so then you plug this guy into here and you get H, G to the power of P is equal to H. This is the equation you get. Clear by now? Okay, so you got to this equation. So what can you confirm about G from this equation? G the power P is is an H. Yeah. Because you know how right process work, right? This thing, H G, H G, H G, this is just H G to the power P. And then from here you obtain that G to the power P is in H. Mm -hmm. Okay. What well, how do you know that G is could H G the power P is equal to H. And any set times okay. something in the set stays in the set. Preparation for the midterm. Prove prove that if uh, H G is equal to H, then G is in H. Is an H. And assume that H is normal here. Also a very nice exercise. Does H have to be normal? Why do it? Does H has to be normal? No, it doesn't. No, no it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You can just do the yep, other. Yep, yep, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yep, yep, you don't have to do the other. Okay. Let my calm correct. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so we get G, G to the power P is an H. Okay? Uh, now, this is still not the G we want in there because. Here we want an element such that it's it, this element raised to the power p is going to give us identity. The only thing we were able to obtain here is element to some power p, which is an h. Okay. Now let's go over here. So uh, note. So since g to the power p is an h, this implies that g p to the power of order of h is identity. Okay? And uh, now let some element c be equal to g to the power of order of h. And I claim, okay, not, did I say c? Not c, let's, let's give it an a. And I claim that this is A is what we want. Honestly, I don't have an immediate explanation why a priori before writing this, you know that this is like a correct element. I think it just comes from, like, I, I cannot like really give an intuition why it did. Like, I can give intuition why all of this is natural up until this step, but then I have no idea like intuitively why this should be like your next step. It's kind of like so that a to the power p is equal to p then. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so from here, we yeah, a to the power p. 
we get that a to the power p is equal to e. It's because you're just switching the which power is inside. Yeah. Okay. So, but the, we are not done yet. So this is definitely what we want. We are trying to prove that order of a is p. Right. Uh, but everybody understands this, right? Okay. Yeah. So we are trying to prove that the order of a is p. But what if a is equal like? From here, we cannot immediately conclude that order of a is p. Why? Why can we not immediately conclude this? <coughs> ah, sorry, one. Ah, p, p, p. My bad. P. Why can we not immediately conclude this? It could be like it's, if it's cyclic, like it could go around like multiple times before you get to e. That I mean, a to the b could be going multiple times. Yeah, that's how I should show the lead. Yeah, you don't have to, it's you have not to the least. Yeah, yeah, so what happens if it's not the smallest? It could be one or just the order times some constant. No, okay, so the claim is, which, which you should also check, uh, if you have g to the, let's say, n is equal to e, then I claim that order of g derives n. So the, that's true. Yeah, so I claim that the following holds. But so what what is another option here instead of this? It's a stupid option, but it can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Another option is that order of A is one. I.e. A is E. Okay? So what we just, like, this is what we want. This is what we are trying to prove. So what all we need is to show that this is not a possibility. Okay, that A is not an identity here. Okay? So why A is not identity? What happens if A is equal to E? Since G is in H and uh, H G is uh, H. If A is the identity, then we kind of we kind of just like be done very quickly now. No, no, no. We need here order of A plus B. A cannot be identity here. Which are those two? If A, I know, but if A is the identity, then the cyclic group generated by oh, it is just G. If if A is wait wait wait. wait. Again? Right, if A is identity, yeah. then order of A is just order of G. No, if A is identity, order of A is one. Oh, I'm wrong. Yeah. If A is identity, then uh, X is H, which means uh, order of X is P. And why is X H? Because uh, G, if A is. Uh, a is identity G, G which is G, A to the, G to the order of H is. Uh, okay, let, let me write this down. I think you are correct. Uh, so, yeah, so what happens if A is equal to B? E? Now we actually have to go into the quotient group to check that this is, could not happen. G to the so, order of H. So, we, so in, like, let us go back into the quotient group. And in quotient group, we looked at H, G, right? This is our X, right? So on one hand, we know that H, G to the, on one hand, we know that this holds. This was one of the things we did, is H. But now we can also use this fact in our quotient group. So on another hand, we have H, X, so the power, uh, wait, was there, there was a B, uh, X to the B equals H? Yeah, uh, X to the order of H, you write this as H, G, order of H, 
and this becomes H G order H, which is actually A. H A. But we assume that A is identical. So, so wait, wait, wait. Yeah, you have G order of H. So then H equals H. It is equal to H. Yeah. And what was the lemma we started? Everybody understands this? How how you derive it? What was the level we started today? Uh, two numbers that are relatively prime. Yeah. And if you raise some element in G yeah. to said numbers, you both get E, then yeah. G is equal to that. And this is exactly what happens here. For right, for the group being a portion oh. group and X being your element. Okay. Okay. So P and order of H are one. And, and uh, why is uh, P and order of H uh, one? Is because H was exactly right. Like we, we kind of started over here. The P is not divisible, so it does not divide order of H. So it has to be relatively prime to P. And so, like going back, so okay, we started in the quotient group. We said P doesn't divide order of H. Uh, oh, I that wasn't the case. Because if P does divide order of H, we have the other thing. I, I, I wonder the, the upper part. Like, as O. Here? Yeah. This or this? You don't the, know. This, this, the second? The first. The first? Yeah. So this is just uh, here. Wait, if a prime number doesn't... It's just the induction assumption as the P is equal to H. This is just an induction assumption. And the second part comes from the idea that suppose we didn't end up in this case, but we end up in that case. Okay. Then you get the second part as well. Mm. Okay? Good? Yeah. So now, these are relatively prime. You have two of these equations. We can apply our... Lemma from the beginning. Lemma, beginning. We obtain that x is actually identity in the quotient group, but what is our identity in the quotient group? H. H. Okay, this is our H. So what does it mean? Well, x was actually HG, so this was in fact HG, and what do we obtain? G is an H. G is an H. And G could not be possibly in H, right? Because if G was in H, then X would be a identity, so it would never have order P, yeah. right? So this is a contradiction. So, contradiction. Contradiction sense order of X is not one. Okay, so this was never a possibility. A was never an identity. So we end up in here, and this is what we want. Okay? So it was that that we assumed that we were using the right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we assume. Did we assume that A equals E? We assume this, that A is equal E to get this line okay. over here. Get, like the second part of it. Okay? So let us like quickly kind of like repeat everything. So we are doing this type of theorem. We run it through induction argument with fixed prime, and then we are running our induction through the order of the group. Okay? So first we prove base cases, base cases are easy. Then we are doing a full induction. We are trying to prove claim AN using all previous claims, which we assume are true, like as our induction hypothesis, right? So we are assuming claim, now we are taking just a random group of order M, and then we kind of get rid of all the things which are obvious. So if our group has no subgroups, then it should be cyclic, everything is easy. Yeah. If there exists a group of order P, and this group is strictly less, then we can just immediately use induction argument. And we arrive to this case where we cannot like now naturally use induction assumption, but we can naturally use it in the portions. 
And that's that's why we're asking the civilian to say that this thing is normal, to actually speak about caution. So now we're starting to talk about caution. Like a order of a quotient is less than order of g and b divides order of quotient because we assume that b does not divide here so we were able what to is wait wait let, let me finish and then we will ask so there then we can we're able to use our reduction assumptions on this thing to obtain some right process such that this holds and from here starts a very technical analysis where you're like, okay, I, I obtained this equation, I obtained that equation. Well, you kind of start to play with it to obtain this equation to actually arrive to the guess of what the element should satisfy. You obtain that, oh, that thing over there, and essentially, if A, you are right to two options that A, order of A is equal to B, or order of A is equal to E, Two equations like here and use lemma from the beginning of the class to conclude that this was never a possibility. So all of this up until here is very standard. Yeah. Up until here. That idea to consider quotient group is very standard. And the idea to apply induction assumption in the quotient group is very standard. After, af after that, this part becomes distant, distinctive for different groups. You know, sometimes you will be immediately say that, oh, then we apply our reduction thing in our portion group and we are done. Sometimes you will have to do work as here. But like this, the part up until going to portion group, apply induction, we're gonna see a lot of times. And like, I don't expect everybody to be familiar with it by the end of the session. This is like one of probably the hardest session you've seen so far. But by the end of this class, you should get familiar with this idea. Do induction argument, analyze cases, find some normal subgroup, get a quotient, apply induction in the quotient, finish up the group. Yeah. When we do the general case, is, it, is the problem trying to find the normal subgroup that we use to analyze the quotient group? Because since this is a billion, it's like easy. Right? Yeah, yeah. So there will always be a good candidate for. So what we're gonna prove is that center. Do, do you yeah, talk about recitation was a center? Yeah. Center is always yeah, normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So center will always be. The center is always normal all the time. The problem about it is that center sometimes can be trivial. Okay, I don't know if it, if it can be trivial, but in any case, it, it is not it is not obvious why center is non-trivial. You know, center is a building. Center by itself is a building. Because itself is a building. No, he's saying that that's always a candidate for a uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Our cent like our center is going to be replaced by this stage, it's, it's but it will not board be board obvious board. why. Order of order of the center of that community is it true? Wait, yeah, 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 yeah. Like if, if center is the whole group, it's actually <coughs> not a bit <coughs> Yeah. Right? So that is like not a problem. But like it's not but obvious why center is, is not equal to one. So the big part is gonna be shown that the center is not yeah. trivial. Yeah. So that then you can do these things. You will be able to substitute center in here. But then the second part might change because you're specifically working with the kind of like a different function. But confirming that it's not trivial is the key. Well, what if the center is trivial? Is another case? Then you uh, then you will have to find another method to prove all of this, or the argument, like the statement will not hold. Oh yeah, because that's that. Do you choose the center because it's like the obvious normal subgroup to use to make quotient groups? So like if you can't even use that, then like there's nothing. What's the obvious normal? What's a normal group that you could use here, not the center? I mean, sometimes you just have to prove that it exists, and maybe to prove that it exists, you like you are saying that center is a good candidate because you always know that it's normal, so it's good strategy to prove that center is not trivial. But in math, sometimes we like we don't have a good candidate, but we can prove that some of them, right, is a good candidate. <laughs> Right, some of them is not trivial. But on top of my head, I don't know any kind of statement to begin with immediately to say that, oh, you kind of like never 
can actually say which normal subgroup you're working on, but you say exists some. Okay. Here we just arrived into this case, but maybe under some under some assumptions, you can immediately say, oh, there is some shade of normal subgroup. Yeah. Please go over the second situation. Here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if G has no subgroups, then I claim that order of G is prime and uh, G is secret. Okay, uh, which, which, what do you want to prove? This implies this or this implies that? Uh, yeah. Which one? This implies this or this implies that? Uh, you can do it both. Both? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just brief explanation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so has a theory or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, um, one direction is just flip around. Which one? I think down up to down. Down to up. Down to up. You say it's like one. We, we, yeah. Because yeah. if it's yeah. prime, then there's no divisors. We're not gonna be able to divide them. Yeah, yeah. So so bottom to the top is the branch. So two implies one. So uh, let some kind of H be uh, some group of G by the branch uh, order of H divides order of G, but order of G. Is prime, so there's no order. which means that the order of H is either P or one. Is one or order of H is P, which forces it to be trivial, but we are searching for non trivial. Okay, so two implies one is easy. Uh, how do you prove one implies two? You say if there's no subgroups, then there's no divisors, and if there's no divisors, it's kind of like Lagrange again. I don't know. I don't know. Can you say that? Can you say that? If there's no subgroups, then there's no, then the I mean, I, I would prove it differently. Uh, I mean, it's definitely not just like branches. They're like for every, maybe like you the order of cyclical element. Order of cyclical Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do order of cyclical element. So, to prove one implies two, you pick some g in g such that g is not equal to e. Okay, if there is no such G, then everything is trivial, right? So we can pick some element which is not identity. And by the way, recall that we started studying group theory by proving identity is unique. Like now everything is obvious, but like at some point it was not obvious that identity is unique. So G is not equal to E, right? But then we can form a cyclic group. We can form a cyclic group. And uh, well, G had no non-trivial subgroups. So cyclic group from, from this element is actually G. So G is in fact cyclic, okay? So we proved one of the parts, so that G is cyclic. Now we only have to do the part about why it is a prime. But if G is cyclic and uh, G is not prime, then G equals, G equals like A, B, E. The part of G equals A, B, E, but so like G to the B, Order of G to the B, then it is not G. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. If G is not the prime, is not prime, there exists then there exists, let's say, P1 not equal to P2, uh, such that both of them divide order of G. And then from here, you can look at element g to the p1 and uh, form a cyclic subgroup of this element yeah. and then the order of this is going to be uh, order of g to divide it by p1 and uh, this is not trivial cyclic subgroup okay i didn't need i just didn't need p2 i just needed this and uh, P1 is not in terms of the word of G. Okay? You'll have this formula in the homework, like I wrote you the course formula. G to the yeah. K is like something something GCT stuff. Yeah. Like you can recall uh, this formula. Did, 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 did. Okay? The, the homework question a while ago, where it's like the GCT has to define the multiplying stuff. Yeah. 
No, pay hey, question. Group time subgroup over GCD is equal to the order. Which part? Right? Wait. No, 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 there's a particular one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we just proved it. We actually didn't do that. Do you understand this? That the second part implies the first? Yeah. Okay, so. I know how to get the like from out, out, Okay, so if G is not prime, G is so suppose G is cyclic and not prime. Okay. Then you take this prime, it is divisor of order of G, but this prime is not equal to order of G. You always do the identity one. Why not? Because this is what we are trying to prove. Yeah. Right? So then you look at some element. Yes, a bit, a bit wider. Uh, so then you look at this element G, which generated your cyclic group. Yeah. And now yeah. you consider G to the P1 and what happens with this element. G to the P1. P1 is the divisor and P1 is not equal to order of G. And I claim that the order of this is going to be order of G divided by P1. Mm -hmm. because, because we actually... You don't need to know this formula for this problem, but we did this formula. Order of G to the K is uh, GCD of what? K and Order of G, K and... Uh, I think it's order of G. Yeah. Right, and in particular in this case, the thing on top is just order of G. Uh, this thing on top is just order of G. And this thing is P1. Mm. And so it is not, it is strictly less than order of G. And so it is a non trivial cyclic subgroup. Mm. This is only true if K is not 1? This. K, something has to be not trivial for it to be strictly. I mean, it is when you have the relativity. Not necessarily relatively prime, but uh, like this thing is uh, bigger than. Oh yeah, this means that they're relatively prime. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, when they are relatively prime. Yeah. Well, not know. not relatively prime. Not relatively prime. Yeah. What? Why? Because two numbers are relatively prime. You can only yeah. GCT of them is, is one. Is one. Yeah. Well, why you can't make the that is the equal to only two divisor? This. Uh, I, I, I mean the, the bottom. The bottom? Oh, the bottom is just this. Or, not necessarily. I mean, I just assume that the GCD of this two I mean, GCD of this two things is going to be... Yeah. It's going to be P. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, it, so it divides... So it's cyclic so it's the order of G... P1 divides order of G over P1 instead of Q. So, like, you can always find one that's... Yeah, yeah. If if order of G is not prime, you can always to be able to do this trick. Yeah. And that's why here we mean order of G is prime. Uh, when you like, like let's say you were thinking of like how to recreate this uh, mm -hmm. induction thing, and you didn't. Uh, uh, you remember when you were like it holds for all cases less than that? Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't think that's a problem until you get here, right? Like the proof worked until you got here and you needed it to work for any age. So you mean why did they choose four cases less than that rather yeah, than like you read, you would have read N minus one? one? Yeah. Uh, okay, no, this part is like whenever you are doing induction, you kind of always assume like this generalized induction of how do you call it? Yeah. Because usually you say suppose it like it works for this case. Or assume it works for this one case. Not for all, this one case in the moment. That's just because you didn't encounter <laughs> induction arguments and kind of like huge theorems. Usually induction arguments and huge theorems are you need to know everything beforehand. I think it's just like, it's, it's more of the teaching problem. Like whenever you first encounter induction in any kind of like class, they give you a small thing where like, oh, here's an equation. Yeah. And Use this equation to prove new equation. Well, if you, if you are using induction for equations, this is kind of like standard, right? But like, usually when you do something for theorems and you need induction, you need previous steps all the time. I think so this, so if you would want to construct this proof and you've never seen it, 
it would be very natural to just assume everything before n falls. But let, that's just because of your kind of education. Yeah. So this is not a particular point. Yeah. Do you think that was like a mindset that you needed to have when you told us a group of wrongs is there on the induction? I don't remember that. Uh, He's only really close to No, anyone. okay. So so I, that one was really annoying. Yeah. So I think so when I said induction there, I think I lied a bit because I thought that this is induction, but then somebody, Oh, we did have that problem. And then somebody okay. in my first, RTA was like this question is No, yeah, we were we were I remember that. I remember that so much. We were like, where is the induction here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And somebody in the first class asked me like, can you prove this using induction? And then I started proving it and I realized that I cannot prove it by induction. <laughs> so what I meant by induction there is an induction construction. Okay. So, Dude, I love like, I should also use my drop homework for that whole, for that assignment just because I couldn't figure that out. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, right so what, what I really meant is induction construction, meaning like, so meaning that you construct everything and you give inductive algorithm, right? So that like, if you constructed some object A, yeah, I give you how yeah. to construct B and plus one. And uh, you provide this algorithm, inductive construction, and then because everything is finite, it will end up somewhere. But then you, you need to prove that you, what you end up is good enough, and you can prove it, I guess, by induction, because you know that on each step it's good. Yeah, it's not enough, yeah. No. Okay, this is getting like really into philosophy of proofs and stuff, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's basically like a re proof recursion, like, okay, whatever, yeah. I know you mean that. Yeah. Okay, questions? Can you explain why, like, the first case and the third case is mutually exclusive? I mean, here we have B device order of subgroup, and here we assume it's not. But they're always just, you can, it's just some, some divide can be divided, it's just some that cannot divide. Yeah, so we assume that there exists some subgroup yeah. such that. B device order of that subgroup, then we assume that there are no subgroups. So if we don't know that there exists a subgroup, it, so from here we know that some subgroup should exist. I mean, the first. Sentence. Okay, okay, let's start with here. It doesn't matter which case we start. Let's start with here. I think this is a better place to start. Let's start with here. We know that from here, we know that if there are no subgroups, we're done. So there should exist some subgroup non trivial. Well, if it's divisible by B, we're done. Let's assume that it's not divisible by B. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, so probably this is better place to start from than that. Are we getting another induction question like this in the homework? I think that'd be very helpful. Because uh, you said you gotta get the, yeah. So I was thinking about doing application two today, but we don't have time. So I'm, I think this was a good lecture, so I'm gonna give Next, next time we're gonna give lecture, we're gonna have another result of this type for abelian stuff. And Boop does it without induction, but I think using induction, it makes life easier and the proof is much shorter if you use induction. So probably what I will do is that I'm gonna assign a homework where I will specifically say uh, kind of like steps to prove it and uh, to, to using induction, and I will ask you to fill out details. Is like, like a question like this probably going to be in the midterm? No, no. no. I, I mean, at this point, this is too complicated. We will not have time. And, but this will be we got on, break, the definitely. Yeah. on the final. Yeah, like I'm definitely going to give you some stuff like this on the final. So we're not going to get some induction type? So, OK, so for the midterm, today's lecture, you don't need to. Uh, no induction on the midterm, or you might have. So no. Okay. Okay. You, you might have induction, but I think right now, like, I would not ask you to recreate all of this. This, like, you need to review normal subgroups. You need to review everything. Like, all of the small things you definitely need to be able to do. But like this logic of induction arguments on all orders and groups, not for me. Too. So this actually not from no. I gave you so much. So many things to think about as preparation questions for the meter. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. question did actually contain a lot. But that, those were, that wasn't the problem. The problem was, I mean, yeah. this, yeah. that step and yeah. this final one. That's you, should, you should start looking at it and you should start to try to figure out. But 
I'm not asking you to figure this out. So we're going to have to reproduce this for the final.